Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and welcome to the weekly Hardware Bolt score roundup number 14. Um, and we have had, like, some epic scores to look at from the last week. Um, you know, multiple quad-core world records, some Threadripper stuff, some multi-GPU stuff, like, been a great week for, for Hardware Bolt scores. So let's get right into it. Starting off with safe disk GPU Pi for CPU 1 billion on a quad uh, top score in the quad core category. Um, man, benchmarks have awful names. <laughs> I need to figure out how to introduce them better. Maybe quad core GPU. Ah, uh, that would make a lot more sense if I said the core count first, then the benchmark. Yes. Okay, we'll do that in the future. Um, but yeah, so quad core GPU Pi for CPU 1 billion. So benchmark that calculates 1 billion, di uh, 1 billion digits of uh, the number Pi uh, using a quad core CPU, of course. Um, and it is multi-threaded. So yeah, having four cores is actually like, like that's why there's a restriction on the core count here. Um, and Safe Disks took the world record in this category using a Ryzen 3 5300G at 5.5, well, just over 5.5 gigahertz. So that chip is absolutely flying. Uh, this is on liquid nitrogen. Now Safe Disk, uh, I believe, works at Asus ROG. So of course he is using an unreleased Asus motherboard. <laughs> Oops. Uh, the ROG Crosshair uh, 8 Extreme. Um, and uh, yeah, so CPU is absolutely flying. Memory doing 4,800 megabits per second, 14, 13, 12, 24 on the timings with a TRC of 36, which it really doesn't get any lower than that for, for your memory time. Like for your primaries at these kinds of frequencies, yeah, it doesn't get any lower than that. Uh, Northbridge, so the Infinity Fabric doing 2400 megahertz, because uh, it's an APU. Um, APUs are monolithic, therefore the A Infinity Fabric is, is it's possible to clock the Infinity Fabric much, much higher. And the benchmark with this setup ran in 2 minutes, 2 seconds, and two, 651 milliseconds. And I forgot to mention that the, the memory used is G-Skills Ripjaws uh, 5 memory. And uh, this is Samsung B die, of course. Like you can tell from the timings, the 4800 megabits CL14. I wonder what memory chip it could be. Uh, <laughs> really, not many memory chips that do that. In fact, there's there's one. There there's one that regularly does that. I think maybe some like super good Samsung E die might be able to do CL14, but not a T like not TRCD13. Um, so. Yeah, so Samsung VDI, of course, um, LN, you know, on LN2, very, re like, rather warm cold bug, as is mentioned down here. So just minus 115 degrees Celsius. Um, so that's, uh, like, that's the main reason we don't see the APUs doing, like, 6 gigahertz or something, is just they don't get that, they don't work properly if you try to push them that cold. But still, like, 5.5 gigahertz is absolutely ridiculous, and it does make it the fastest quad core in this benchmark. And also, uh, apparently, uh, Arctic MX-5 works great on liquid nitrogen, as Safe Disk has a ton of it. Admittedly, um, it seems that Arctic sent him a bunch of it, but the fact that he seems to be using it indicates that it's actually good. <laughs> Because uh, the, the thing is, is like, there's a lot of thermal pastes where if you try to run them on liquid nitrogen, they just fail at like, like I had uh, some, t like some, at like say minus 60 degrees, they just disconnect basically. And your temp, like your temperature difference between the, the temperature of the silicon and the LN2 pot suddenly skyrockets. And yeah, it's, it's really bad. So um, it's cool to see that there's more options for extreme overclocking thermal paste now than there used to be. Cause it really like basically was like you had jelly GC, GC extreme, then Cryonaut came out. And so that was kind of cool. Then we got the Kingpin cooling KPX paste. Uh, then there's Cryonaut extreme now. And now apparently even Arctic MX five is a viable option for LN2 overclocking. I mean, technically, you can run a lot of thermal paste on LN2, but some of them will actually, like, they do actually cost you frequency if they're bad enough. Um, unlike on Ambient, where you're looking at, like, a couple degree differences, on LN2, if the thermal paste doesn't work properly, it really doesn't work properly. It's a huge problem. Like, it, y you'll see a huge difference in terms of what you can do um, based on, like, what, what thermal paste you're using. So anyway, uh, yeah, so Safe Disk took the quad-core... 
uh, GPU Pi for CPU 1 billion world record, and then he went and took the Quad Core Geekbench 3 record, because uh, this is, like, the 5300G is now one of the fastest Quad Core CPUs around, um, right? The only other, like, overclockable Quad Cores that are worth sort of overclocking are, like, Sky, uh, are KB like chips, um, and well, they were getting kind of old, and in a lot of benchmarks, yeah, the, the 5300G just has a massive advantage. So, uh, Geekbench 3, same memory settings, same motherboard, same everything. Like, this really looks like he ran one benchmark and then ran the next benchmark in some order. Um, and, uh, yeah, memory score is absolutely ridiculous thanks to the, uh, well, the fact that it's a monolithic memory, like, the, the chip is monolithic, and then also the memory settings that safe disk is running here, so 11,678 points on, on the memory score, and then the overall score is 32,200 points, um, so just slightly above the, uh, second place that actually also got posted in the, in this last week. Um, and so safe disk, you know, quad core Geekbench also took the world record for that. And then he also took the world record for quad core Y Cruncher Pi 1 billion. Um, now Y Cruncher is insanely heavy. This is about as close to a stress test as it gets for benchmarks on hardware bot. Um, and so the CPU, like previously for both Geekbench and for, uh, GPU Pi, the 5300G was doing, you know, a little over 5.5 gigahertz. For Y Cruncher, uh, 5.4, <laughs> because Y Cruncher is very, very hot, very, very heavy, and also pretty long. Like that's 53 seconds of like full core AVX load. So, yeah, um, a very, very heavy benchmark. It also doesn't tolerate super unstable memory settings. So the memories drop down from 40, like 4,800 megabits per, uh, per second. Uh, at uh, CL14 all the way down to 4133 megabits per second CL14 um, because yeah white cruncher does not appreciate unstable memory overclocks whatsoever whereas something like geekbench just ju doesn't care uh, GPU Pi also doesn't really care that much I mean geekbench cares a bit it's not quite like cinebench is the the one where it's like your memory could literally just like you could have trouble saving a screenshot and it'll probably still run cinebench um but yeah, uh, so Geekbench isn't quite so bad, but compared to Y Cruncher, it, it's a joke. It's super easy to finish Geekbench compared to Y Cruncher. Um, so yeah, somewhat lower clocks, but still the same hardware, right? Same like same everything. This is obviously from from pro well probably from the same session. Um, and yeah, a very very solid score in in Y Cruncher here, um, and uh, yeah. Also, I guess we should sort of take a look at how this compares to the old uh, KB Lake chips. So, in GPU Pi, the 5300G is just, like, ridiculously overpowered. It's, like, a minute faster. <laughs> like, the slow one of the slowest 5300G scores on hardware bot right now is a minute faster than the very fastest 7740X. Um... But in Geekbench, um, we don't see quite as drastic a difference, right? Like, the 7740X is only 2,000 points behind instead of a minute behind. And then in uh, Y Cruncher, uh, the difference shrinks even further, as there it's just a two-second difference. Actually, it's not even two seconds um, between the fastest 7740X and the fastest 5300G. This honestly looks like if somebody had a really, really good 7740X and a good set, like, w good set of memory that you could probably still retake first place on a 7740X. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, 5300G is now the new king of the quad-core CPUs. Um, and so congratulations to Safe Disk on the three world records. I think he might have actually posted... I think it's just the three. I, I didn't spend that much time searching through all the different submissions because there was a lot of really great scores posted last week. Uh, Noms uh, also posted a bunch of great scores on a 5350G, which is basically a 5300G. It's just got an extra 50 in the name. Um, 
So I guess this this he had to pull. Actually, you have to pull all of these out of pre-builds because AMD refuses to sell 5300 Gs to as as retail CPUs, which I find very frustrating. Like this this looks like a really fun chip for extreme overclocking, and, and AMD is just like, no, we're not selling it. But um, yeah, so Noms got his hands on a 5350G, um, which is is a Ryzen 3 Pro CPU, and apparently those are supposed to be locked, except AMD. Like, it's kind of funny. They're better at locking their GPUs than they are at locking their CPUs. Um, so, good job, AMD, on that. Anyway, 5350G, Geekbench 3, second place. Um, obviously in quad-core Geekbench 3. Uh, doing just under 5.5 gigahertz at 5.473. And also just a massive memory score. You know, admittedly down a thousand points, but that's, like, still a very, very good memory score. Uh, running on a Asus uh, Crosshair 8 Impact motherboard, doing just 4533 CL14. That's not very fast. Then again, with the chip on LN2, you know, the Infinity Fabric might not like the, the low temperatures very much. Um, and so, you know, the, like, the, the thing is, is ambient overclocking behavior and sub-zero, like, especially on memory, like, it can be very, very different. A lot of the time, it's much worse on LN2 when it comes to memory overclocking, especially with uh, a very w wide range of AMD CPUs. Uh, you end up with... Because, like, this is an issue even on, like, Phenom 2s, where it's like you, you go from ambient, where the memory overclocking is eh, by DDR3 standards, and then you get to, like, minus 100 degrees, and with some chips, it gets absolutely horrendous. Um... Like it goes from unimpr like it goes from you know mediocre to just horrible, um, so yeah. And the APUs, so like I've not run a five thousand series APU on LN two myself, but I would not be surprised if they they had, you know, the usual Ryzen cold weirdness that that we're used to seeing with Ryzen. So yeah, still a very very solid score, right? Second place in the the quad core. Uh, Geekbench 3 rankings with this 5350G, and then also a second place in GPU Pi for, for CPU, again again in the quad-core rankings, and same setup again. Um, also running, you know, G-Skill Flarex memory, so Samsung B-Die there. And so, uh, yeah, this time for, for GPU Pi, though, he did manage to clock, clock the chip up to 5.525 gigahertz, so, yeah. Impressive scores from Noms there on the 5300, like 5350G, and congratulations to him on that. And let's move on to the next score, which is Arsenino's Geekbench 3. Uh, no, we're core count first. Arsenino's 32 core Geekbench 3 uh, score, like world record with the Ryzen Threadripper 3970X, um, doing 5.5 gigahertz. Now, with the with the 5350G, right, these have a cold bug and, and there's all that going on, which is why you can't push the frequency that high. This has a lot of cores. <laughs> this has a completely different issue. Uh, it is very much possible to run Threadrippers at full pot. The thing is, this is a 32 core CPU. It pulls a lot of power. It gets very hot. And so even if you have it at like the low, like, the the thing is like even if you have this chip at full pot it's not necessarily going to clock that great just because of how much heat it's going to produce right we're at 1.75 volts here which uh i think the 5300g's are actually yeah because smaller like you can the thing is the less cords you have the more voltage you can get away with um but uh yeah with the 3970x so 1.752 volts i'd love to know what temperature this was at like what well, LN2 pot temperature this this was run at, but yeah, the the thread rippers are insanely difficult to overclock. They pull a ton of power. The memory system gets super weird. Your Infinity Fabric doesn't like running cold. In fact, thread rippers, in my opinion, don't like running in general. <laughs> like memory overclocking on thread ripper is just generally unpleasant, in my opinion. Um, and so, yeah, here here we have you know a. Uh, like, and on LN2, it's just that much harder. So, and actually, in terms of the memory settings, this this is insane, because we are looking at 4,600 megabits per second CL14 on a Threadripper. Now, on a regular Ryzen, I wouldn't be that impressed by that, but this is a Threadripper on liquid nitrogen 
on, like in quad channel. And the thing is, yeah, so that that is just an insane memory overclock for for a Threadripper. Though the memory score in Geekbench isn't really that high. And I kind of suspect it might have something to do with the TRC over there being at 71. Fun fact, TRAS and TRP basically don't do anything. It's all down to your TRC timing. Like, you can change these two a lot, and it doesn't really make a difference to, ma to many benchmarks. But you lower the TRC from, like, 71 to 40. Um, huge performance gains. Also, most memory chips don't do a TRC of 40 whatsoever. Um, so... Yeah, that's, again, Samsung B-Die memory, of course. Just, you can see the timings, right? But yeah, so still, though, the memory frequency here and the, at least the, like, CAS, uh, like, CAS, TRCD, uh, TRP, TRAS timings are, well, about as low as they go, um, especially for Threadripper systems. Like, Threadripper is, like, imagine memory overclocking on Ryzen. Now imagine if it was worse. That's Threadripper. Um, <laughs> and, uh... Yeah, so just just an insane score. Like for the memory overclock, the fact that this chip is doing 5.5 gigahertz on 32 cores, right? And this is with all threads enabled because Geekbench goes up to these core counts just fine. So, yeah, massive score beating the previous record by a thousand points. And this was run on the Asus uh, Zenith 2 Extreme with some Hall of Fame memory from from Galax. So, yeah, I wish we had a system pick for this, but Great score from, from Arsenino. Congratulations to him on the, the record in 32-core Geekbench 3. Now let's move on to the next score, which is Oviz Hardware Labs uh, Triple GPU Unigen Superposition 1080p Extreme record. Um, that's a long benchmark name. <laughs> so we've got three R9 290Xs at 1225 on the core, 1575 on the memory, a 5900X at 5 gigahertz on chilled water cooling, running only six cores, which is very interesting. Um, so I guess this is one of those benchmarks that, uh, yeah, this is going to be one of those benchmarks that actually ends up being like, actually, it might not scale properly with core count. Because there's a, quite a few benchmarks where if you have too many cores, your score goes down. So this might be one of those. Or it's just a case of it prefers frequency over over core count, which would also make sense. It's a GPU benchmark. If there's like basically, if you if you're just running GPU workloads, you shouldn't really need a lot of CPU power. Like that's why 3D marks have like a physics test, which is intentionally CPU heavy. Um, yeah, superposition doesn't have that. So we have the 5900X doing only six cores and six threads here. So just one CCD. That would actually probably help with memory latency quite a bit just because all of your data is always in the same CCD instead of potentially having to go through the IO die for, to talk to the other cores on the other CCD. Um, and then the 290Xs here are also on chilled water cooling. You know, and 1225 on a 290X, that's, especially three of them, that's hard. Like, they pull a lot of power, they get very hot. So 1225 core is certainly uh, an impressive clock speed to be running on three of them. And then 1575 on the memory is just kind of like, well, they are 290Xs, so what, what do you expect? Like, there are 290Xs that can do very high memory clocks, but the vast majority of them don't. And so, you know, having three cards that could run, and 1575 is actually still a very, very solid memory clock speed for 290Xs. Like, there's a lot of cards that will not go over 1500, or even 1450. Like, so, yeah, this this is just, like, core clock's very high, uh, memory clock's very high. Though, I'm surprised that for chilled water cooling, these aren't doing, like, 1300 core. Um... Though, looking at the VDDC monitoring in GPU-Z down here, it looks like they're not really, like, Ovis isn't running that much voltage into these. Um, then again, I'm not sure how, like, how well the chiller's handling it. The cards are at 28 degrees Celsius, so I guess this is kind of their... Well, actually, max temperature was 28 degrees Celsius. Nah, I'd whack 1.4 volts into this. I'd totally whack 1.4 volts into this. It would probably shut down whatever... If this is on a single PSU, that's actually probably the main reason not to raise the voltage. Because uh, you can get a 290X to easily pull around 450 watts on its own. If you have three of them, you're going to need at least, like... I mean, you're going to want a 1500 watt power supply, basically. If you're going to be really pushing 290Xs, you're going to want a 1500 watt power supply. 
probably maybe more than that, maybe two. Um, and like, like maybe like two PSUs and like 1300 watts each or something because... Yeah, they do pull a hell of a lot of power. And then also from what I've heard, Superposition is actually just a very hard to run benchmark in terms of just getting it set up for especially something like a triple GPU run. Um, because of course, multi GPU setups, um, as fun as they like, I, I'm a big fan of them for, for like benchmarking because it's just cool to have three GPUs instead of just one. Um, but so the software support is terrible. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, though I will say, enabling crossfire is much easier, at least, I'm not sure how bad it is for superposition, but in my past experience, crossfire is less difficult to set up than SLI. As in, crossfire will pretty much automatically enable itself, and then, and then everything doesn't run any, that doesn't run properly on it anyway, whereas I, like, it, I've, enabling SLI, on the other hand, much more fiddly, for whatever reason. So... Yeah, still, congratulations to, to Ova's Hardware Lab on, on the just the, you know, very, very fast run of uh, Unigen Superposition here with the three 290Xs. Um, and I actually want to take a look at uh, the rankings a bit because, uh, yeah, this is really a... Like, I wonder if maybe the benchmark prefers memory clock a bit more than core clock, but at the same time, there is the CPU difference, though I'm not sure that that would be doing... Like, that's only 14 points. Then again, like, that that could be, like, actual, like, it could actually be it. Or, like, it's not even 14 points, that's 10 points. <laughs> that could be part of that. These are doing 1240 with 1500 on the memory. Yeah, 1550 on the memory. Um, you could have maybe modified memory timings. Um, then again, it might just be down to, like, getting the benchmark to run. And then this also looks like you... I'll, there's probably some run-to-run -run variance, so some of this will maybe just come down to, like, how many times did you rerun the benchmark <laughs> before you got the score that you wanted. Um, but yeah, so, like, honestly, it's really cool to see the sort of triple GPU Unigen superposition rankings heating up, I guess. Like, there's there's a lot of action in this recently, and especially on 290Xs, which I think are just, like, those were good GPUs. Okay, the, those are the kinds of G... Like, I have a lot of 290Xs. I have a concerning amount of 290Xs. So I love, like, old 28 nanometer AMD GPUs. I love them. And so I'm a big fan of just more multi-GPU 28 nanometer AMD scores. Like, yeah, so congratulations to Ovis Hardware Lab on the triple GPU Unigen Superposition 1080p Extreme World Record. And let's move on to the next score, which is Char 00750's uh, dual core Cinebench R20 uh, fifth place uh, score on an i3-7350K at 6.55 gigahertz. And this score got into the ranking for a very simple reason. I Like, who doesn't like seeing an i3 going very, very fast? Right, like especially with how few, like we don't get unlock like unlocked i3s. There was technically the A350K, but that's actually not a popular like competitive overclocking CPU because while it was a quad core, which technically is like it's got more cores than a dual core with hyper threading, and that does make it a better CPU than a dual core with hyper threading. It also means it gets to compete in the quad core benchmark rankings where it's going up against like i7s and stuff. So unfortunately. Uh, yeah, the only sort of really competitive i3 uh, k skew. Actually, this is probably the only i3 k skew. I can't think of any other i3 k chips. So yeah, th this is really the only competitive i3 k CPU, and it's just a fun CPU, um, in my opinion. Like, I wish Intel made more, like, low-end overclocking chips. Like, they don't even need to be good or reasonable. They just need to be cheap. And, like, a single core with hyper-threading, please. <laughs> um, or just more dual cores with hyper-threading. Like, like, at this point, right now, that doesn't make sense, because obviously we're just still using Skylight. Well, well, no, a dual core based on the Rocket Lake cores would be cool, right? But, yeah, for, for the longest time, we've been just recycling the Skylight cores, so there wasn't really much of a reason to replace the 7350K, but it would be cool to see more CPUs like this in the future. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of these scores. Motherboard used for this, uh, Maximus 9 Apex, 
probably one actually pretty much the best z270 uh ln like overclocking motherboard there is um memory doing what is that 4160 megabit yeah 4160 cl 16 17 17 35 that is like the timings are loose but the frequency is rather high for an i3 because the i3s they're not based on the same silicon as the 7700k they have a smaller die and man the memory controller they come with is terrible <laughs> um or at least it's nowhere near as good as what you'd get on a 7700K. And the 7700K memory controller compared to what we have now is actually still really, really weak. Um, it's kind of interesting, like, it's kind of fun to see the progress of, of DDR3 memory controllers over time. Like, th these days, you can do this kind of frequency with, like, this is daily. This is, like, daily timings. Now, admittedly, this is Cinebench R20, so it doesn't really care that much about your memory settings. Um... And the CPU is absolutely flying right. 6.5 gigahertz on on both of the on the two cores, and six gigahertz uncore frequency. That is very high on the cores for a 7350K. Like not only is the memory controller on them generally kind of well not great, they are a different die from 7700Ks. So it's not like they're binning reject 7700Ks, but for whatever reason they don't tend to clock as well as 7700Ks do. Like, the average 7700K should be doing, like, 6.5, 6.6 gigahertz for something like Cinebench. Uh, 7350Ks are lucky to do 6.6, .6, right? Like, th that's that's kind of the difference there. Um, so, yeah, a 6.55 gigahertz, like, a 6.55 gigahertz 7350K is just very, very impressive. Also... Uh, these chips are fiddly to run at full pot. Um, more recent Intel CPUs have gotten a lot easier, but with 7350Ks and some of them, like the, the Apex does technically have a switch to make your life, uh, like make it much easier to get to full pot temperatures uh, with KB-like CPUs. But that switch, in my experience, doesn't seem to be tuned, like it's tuned more for the i7s than it is for the i3s. And you end up having to like manually configure a lot of the boot up voltages because that's the, that's the trick to getting these chips to run at... Uh, uh, full pot temperatures is like you need a very specific level of for a bunch of di vi like supporting rails of the CPU and I'm not talking like V core we're talking like VCCIO, VCCPLLOC, VCCPLL and a bunch of other minor rails like VCCST um, you know voltages that in day to day like in regular overclocking you would never touch in a million years and on LN2 they're absolutely critical on on these chips to get them to even turn on and then there's a bunch of tuning you can do to try get them to be a bit more stable um, and yeah so so these are these are like really fiddly CPUs to run uh, also the memory is obviously Samsung B die um, we can't actually we can see that that's a G skill Trident Z heat spreader over there and uh, yeah, so a very solid score here from Shark, like literally top five seven three fifty k score, like a great score from Shar here in the dual core Cinebench R twenty rankings with his i three seven three fifty k. Yeah, congratulations to him on that. And let's move on to the next score, which is Zarox seventy sevens Geekbench three. I did it again, Zarox quad core Geekbench three. <laughs> Uh, top score for the Ryzen 3 3300X. So, fifth place in the quad-core rankings in the world. So, certainly, like, yes, the 5300G is the new, like, the latest and greatest quad-core CPU that AMD makes. But the 3300X is still extremely capable, and this is the fastest 3300X to ever get posted to, uh, posted to Hardware Ball, at least when it comes to running Geekbench 3. Doing 5.75 gigahertz. And the memory doing 40, what is that, 4266? Yeah, 4266 megabits per second, 14, 14, 12. Those are some wacky timings, but, like, he is minimizing them, so at least it's nice to see that. Uh, 8,625 points on the memory. The thing is, when you're on LN2 with, with Ryzen 3000 chips, you have to underclock the Infinity. Like, you have to run the Infinity fabric at low clocks in order to get the temperatures down. Um... So, yeah, like, that, and the thing is, with low infinity fabric clock, your memory, like, you're literally slowing down the entire memory system, because, you know, you, and that's where you lose a lot of your memory scores, just, like, 
so the, the the memory controller has to slow down in order to function at the lo really low temperatures or more like the connection from the memory controller to the cores has to slow down because the memory controller itself that's still doing 40 like 2133 megahertz right um but the infinity fabric <laughs> um is uh actually no not necessarily the memory controller has you have the uclk the thing is if you're at ambient, you can technically run two to one mode and still get a very good uh, Geekbench 3 memory score. But when you're on LN2, you basically can't. Because not only are you in like two to one mode, your Infinity Fabric isn't going to be doing 1900 megahertz or 1800 megahertz. A lot of the time, chips are doing like 1200 megahertz Infinity Fabric. Um, and then your then your memory score just falls off a cliff because it just takes forever to to get data from the memory controller to the cores. So, yeah, um, that's that's what's going on there. But still, um, you know, that that didn't stop Zarok to, from from taking the first place in the thirty three hundred X rankings, using a Crosshair Eight Dark Hero motherboard and a very unique approach to mounting that LN two paw. I actually theory like I actually had this idea because I have this exact same problem. None of my LN two pots are designed for AM four. Like, they don't have AM4 mounting brackets. So when I've run AM4 in the past, what I would do is I would just use two uh, two mounting rods and only run, like, an Intel mounting layout. Like, use the Intel mounting holes. Um, but, yeah, alternatively, you could take a AIO uh, mounting plate like this and just use that to hold the LN2 pod in place. Um, so, yeah, that, that's cool to see that, you know. I don't necessarily... I don't know that this necessarily helps much. Ryzen chips are soldered, so they're not as... Like, yeah, Ryzen chips are soldered. Um, so I don't think the, like, mounting... Pro like, I, I don't consider it as critical to have, like, really great mounting... A really great mounting setup on these CPUs as, say, some Intel chips. Um, but yeah, still cool to see a unique way of getting the LN2 pod attached. Especially one that, like, I, I thought about. I was like, I'm surprised I've not seen anybody do this. Well, now I have. So, um, yeah, that's a thing. Um, then we have G-Skill Trident Z memory. Obviously, Samsung BDI based on the timings, of course. Uh, and the board's really free. I, this almost looks like he froze it on purpose. Your chips at heatsink should not be getting covered in ice if you're... Like, the LN2 goes here, not here. <laughs> I think this was just done to make the photo look cooler. And it works. Like, I, I think it looks, like, it, it does look kind of cool. But, uh, yeah. Um, so, a very, very solid score from Zarok here. Like, fastest 3300X. And, sure, the 3300X isn't, you know, cool anymore now that the 5300G G came out. But, uh, it is still a very cool score. Right, like it's not no longer it's no longer competitive for the outright world record, but it's still a very interesting CPU to overclock. Like any any CPU that is overclockable is interesting to overclock, and this is a very solid score here. So yeah, congratulations to Xerox seventy seven. Because this this is one of those chips. Like this is a very similar chip to the seven three fifty K. So yeah, like I'm I'm a big fan of just seeing low end C like cheaper CPUs going stupid fast. <laughs> so. Congratulations to Zarok77 on his quad-core Geekbench 3 top score for the 3300X. Uh, let's move on to the next score, which is Redstone Sam's uh, single GPU 3D Mark Times by Extreme top score for the 6900 XT. Actually managing to get the card to ninth place in the overall rankings for 3D Mark Times by Extreme, which is very impressive. I didn't think the 6900 XT would be that competitive. Um, looks like I need to figure out how to run Time Spy Extreme, and what, well, actually, Redstone has, Redstone, Sam here has done a lot of the work for me. Apparently the 5950X is perfectly adequate for this, um, so that's great. I was worried I'd have to use Threadripper, which I really don't want to do. Um, so, yeah, 5950X doing 4.8 gigahertz, and then the... 6900 XT, are we going to see a... Ah, uh, yeah, you can see a Elmore EVC just hanging out in there. Man, it is really cool to see, like, a full custom loop like this get benched. Because most of the... Like, most of the people running hardware... Like, you know, competing on hardware bot... Um, well, first of all, <laughs> they're li likely to use an LN2 cooling system. They're likely to not post a picture of the system. Um... 
or they're likely to post something that looks like this, right? <laughs> uh, whereas this is actually, like, this is a proper build, except, you know, so that's really cool to see. Um, and actually, that's, let's check the ch uh, 3D Mark uh, statistics for the card, because I'm wondering. Man, the clock readouts in 3D Mark just never make any sense to me. Um, yeah, because GPU 2665, 2830, I am, I well, the card is running at something other than stock, otherwise it wouldn't be in the top nine of Time Spy Extreme runs in, on the hardware bot rankings, so it's certainly not running stock. Um, memory doing 2110. Uh, so kind of low on the memory. In my ex my experience with the 6900 XT for TimeSpy is that actually TimeSpy is really sensitive about the memory stability. Like with some other benchmarks, you can get away with far higher uh, memory clocks, but TimeSpy really doesn't like it when you push the memory too far. So that makes sense. Uh, and then Crosshair 8 Dark Hero. And is this just single rank or no, dual rank Samsung B-Die? Um... This almost looks like daily memory settings. He should he should push that further. Um, yeah, definitely should push the like I, should push this further. Actually, the GPU almost looks daily, especially on water cooling. Like you could daily it with you know extra voltage from the EVC two. Though I don't think he does because that looks bloody horrible. <laughs> like the way that is currently installed just looks horrible. You could probably sneak it. I wonder, you could probably hide it behind the radiator somewhere. If you, like, got clever with where the uh, I2C cables went. Or you could just jam it between, like, the I.O. play, like, in the... Yeah, I actually, because you do need the tight... You need the USB cable. So you could sneak the USB cable over the PCIe bracket over here or, or through it. Like, there's a hole over there. You can get... I, I think you can get a USB cable through that. You could, like, stick the EVC to the back of the card and then just run the cable. You could actually probably hide the cable under the M.2, uh, M.2, like, heatsink here. Um, or, like, yeah, you could hide the cable under the M.2 heatsink. And then you could have this installed permanently. And you could actually daily the 6900 XT with, with extra voltage. Um, so... Yeah, this is a really, really cool score. I mean, when I when I include this this in the roundup, I didn't even realize we'd actually be looking at like a full cut, like a, a very night, like you know, clean, uh, day like daily system build instead of a crazy test bench. But um, yeah, especially one with hardline tubing. Man, it must have been a real pain to install that that voltage controller, unless he, unless he did that before assembling the loop. Because if you assembled this, you'd, like, I don't think you'd want to be, well, you could certainly solder the EVC to the card with the card already inside the system. I just think that seems like a really clunky way. It's just three connect. It's, it's relatively easy to do, though. So, yeah, that's not that clunky. You might, yeah, I might have done it that way. Anyway, still a really, really cool score. And also just a cool system to, to see in the rankings. Top score for the 6900 XT and Time Spy Extreme. Um, and yeah, so congratulations to Red, uh, congratulations to Redstone Sam on the, uh, single GPU 3D Mark Times by Extreme, uh, top score for the 6900 XT. And let's move on to the next score, which is negative feedbacks, uh, 3D Mark Fire Strike, uh, single GPU 3D Mark Fire Strike second place with the Radeon R9 280X. I think it should be plenty obvious to everybody why this made it into the roundup. It's a 28 nanometer AMD GPU. I wonder why this would be in one of the one of these roundups. So doing 1330 on the core, which is actually like that's fast. For for Tahiti core, that's fast. And I believe these aren't technically referred to as Tahiti, but I don't really care. Um does it not say what they're No, it is it's still referred to as Tahiti. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, a Tahiti core, you know, doing 1330 on the, on the core, 1850 on the memory. Uh, I'm assuming tightened up memory timings, hopefully tightened up memory timings. Like you really want to tighten up your memory timings on these GPUs. It's totally worth doing. Um, 
as uh, yeah, that, that can really give you a pretty significant bump in the combined score, especially. So, no, I'm not sure if that applies to, no, this is regular Fire Strike. So yeah, for Fire Strike, you definitely want to tighten up your sub timings. I'm, you're like, not sub timings, memory timings. Just, just take the lower frequency strap and put it into the higher frequency. That's really, like that alone will give you quite a big performance increase in, in the combined test because the combined test is for whatever reason, extremely GPU memory sensitive. Uh, as in, more memory clock equals more performance. Better memory timings equal, I mean, equals more score, which basically just means more FPS. So, yeah. Um, this kind of looks to me like this is on, on stock memory timings, just based on the combined score there. Because it is entirely possible to run a... Actually, maybe not. This is a 4881. This is a 4849. And this thing's doing 1370 on the core with 1750 on... Eh, no, because 1850 on the memory would do it, I think. Because, again, combined really doesn't care that much about the memory, like the core clock. And the difference between, like, 1370 versus 1330 might sound like a lot, but in terms of actual percentages, it's like 3%. It's actually less than 3%. So it's really not much on the on the core clock, but the memory clock advantage for, for combined would be quite significant there. Uh, even though that's also not that big, that's sort of, sort of in the range of like five percent, um, isn't it? Yeah, that's somewhere in the range of like five to six percent, like five to seven percent. So, yeah, that's still a very, very like you know a very good score, second place in in the in the R nine two eighty two eighty X rankings, and yeah, memory timing adjustments. The fifty eight hundred X here is absolutely flying at four point nine five gigahertz on all cores, I guess. 101 megahertz BCLK, so I am... Oh, right, B550 motherboard, of course. <laughs> it's like, like if you see somebody running anything other than 100 megahertz BCLK on Ryzen, it probably isn't X570, because doing that on X570 causes the chipset to just hate everything. So, yeah. So, Gigabyte B550 AORUS Pro motherboard, memory doing 1900, 12, 12, 12, easy. Like if you've got a strong set of Samsung B dive for Fire Strike, this is this is easy to do. Uh, single rank memory, um, which just kind of makes that even easier to do those super low timings. Um, yeah, so just an all around very, you know, very solid. Uh, just GPU overclock, CPU overclock, memory overclock, everything overclocked. Um, though I do wonder about the memory timings. Also, that looks a lot like a 280x toxic oh yeah yeah that's a 280x toxic it has to be because you've got the little led things over there um so these have a really wacky vrm and then he's using the ebc2 for voltage control which i'm not sure how well that works i've never messed around it with it on my 280x toxic though it is something i want to try because it does support the controller it's a the controller on this card is a chl 8228g which is the standard controller for 7970s and 280x's and that's a fully digital controller from Chill, and it is supported by the EVC too. So, um, yeah, that should make voltage control very, very, uh, very easy. Um, and then we've just got a fan, like what looks like an absolute screamer of a fan on the VRM cool for for VRM cooling, and then uh, a 120 millimeter fan to cool the to cool the memory on the card. So. Yeah, that's a very, very solid uh, overclock. And we've got some details pretty much done working on this card. Insulated. Oh, this is going on dry ice. I want to sell that. 1400. Well, 1400 should be easy. 1500. If, the, if this is going on dry ice, at least 1500. <laughs> if this is going on LN2, uh, 1600, seven, like more. Just more. Like, I think eight. 1800 is technically possible on Tahiti cores, but you, the, you do need a really good card at that point. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to say that that's even possible, but certainly, like, if he's going to take this Sub-Zero, then it should have no problem. Like, well, depends how Sub-Zero. If it's just a water chiller, then, okay, it's probably not going to do 1500. But if you're going to hit it with dry, like, if he hits it with dry ice, 1500 should definitely be possible. Uh, and yeah, modded on, on the memory timing, so that explains the, the combined, um, 
So, and Bile's power limit maxed as well. I don't think you even need to do that. I've never seen a 7970 power throttle. I have a sneaking suspicion the power limit on those cards doesn't work. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't remember. Like, I've had 7950s shut down on me due to overcurrent protection. But I've never seen them power throttle. So, yeah, not sure what's up with that. But either way, a very solid score. And, uh, yeah, I should have just scrolled down to check the memory timings, but... I mean the yeah the memory timings thing for the GPU, but congratulations to negative feedback and uh, good luck with uh, taking first place because it sounds like this card is going to be seeing some form of cold, and it is already very very close to taking first place with just the the regular water cooling. So um, it it should really do it if if he takes it any colder. So. Anyway, let's move on to the next score, which is Dan Gilmore's uh, Super Pi 32M uh, top score for the 5820K. Um, so we've got some Haswell E action, and these CPUs, at least in the UK right now, are ridiculously cheap um, because they've been made completely obsolete by Ryzen, right? Like, it's a very power-hungry, kind of slow 6-core at this point. Um, and the motherboards, unfortunately, um, well, yeah, especially the, like, the thing is, like, the 5820K doesn't even have that many PCIe lanes. It only has 28 PCIe lanes. So, yeah, these CPUs are, like, surprisingly cheap right now. Um, and Dan Gilmore here is running at, at 5.5 gigahertz on dry ice, um, on a MSI X99A X Power Gaming Titanium motherboard, which is one of the few X99 motherboards I approve of, because man, X99 is a horrible platform. <laughs> um, and we can sort of see why it is that I approve of this motherboard, because it does have an OC socket, so it can do high uncore clocks. So, you know, almost 4.4 gigahertz uncore, which is critical for a benchmark like SuperPi because SuperPi is very memory intensive, so uncore intensive. And then speaking of memory intensive, we're looking at 3333 megabits per second, 12, 11, 11, 28, uh, with 240 clock TRFC. That's kind of loose for such a low frequency um, and 1T command rate. So the X99 memory controller, this is actually about as good as it gets. Um, well, for the Haswell E memory controller, this is about as good as it gets. Um, I have a, I were, actually, I think I might, I don't think I have that chip anymore, or no, maybe I do. Uh, I have, or had, a 5960X that did basically like 3000 CL10, at best. And I'm entirely serious about that. <laughs> it's a horrible CPU. So yeah, um, memory overclocking on, on X99 is just kind of, like, the low frequencies all kinds of training issues. This is a platform that very regularly will like boot with like a memory channel missing or you'll get all the way into Windows and then you'll check your available memory and that's when you'll find out you're missing a memory channel because like even, even CPU-Z won't necessarily detect it when the CPU randomly decides to drop one of the memory channels. So very hard platform to work with, very annoying platform to work with and a lot of the motherboards make it that much worse. Uh, the X Power is one of the nicer ones. Um, and then the chip itself is doing 5.5 gigahertz, which is very high. Like, this is a, Has you know, 22 nanometer Haswell 6-core CPU. I'm surprised he doesn't disable more of the cores. If I remember correctly, X99 actually introduced the ability to disable specific cores. So I'm surprised that we're not seeing three cores, three threads, because, you know, like, this is on dry ice, so you do want to minimize the heat output of the CPU as much as possible. And also just running, like, if you figure out, and I, I might be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure X99 allows you to disable specific cores, though that might depend on the motherboard. Um, but if you disabled all the worst cores, that could give you some extra frequency. Um, which for something like SuperPi obviously helps immensely because this is a single-threaded, uh, you know, very CPU, like, it loves CPU frequency and it r loves tight memory timings and high memory frequency. Like, it, it's sort of the everything single-core benchmark, right? Like, CPU frequency, yes. Memory frequency, yes. Memory timings, yes. Uncore frequency, yes. It, like, likes all of them. Um, yeah, still, though, a very, very solid score here. 
um, with you know Benchmate to for for the validation. Um, and yeah, it's just cool to see uh, you know somebody running the five eight twenty k again because uh, these these are well annoying CPUs, but they're still kind of fun. Like I think all of the HEDT platforms are kind. Of, actually, there's not really a lot of hardware that I don't think is cool. Uh, which might explain my motherboard collection. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, great to see a, a 5820K at, you know, 5.5 gigahertz on dry ice. And I'm still, still though, I think disabling some cores on this would have been a good idea. Unless, like, the last, unless the motherboard doesn't allow disabling specific cores, which I might be misremembering. And the last, last core is the best. Um, right. If the if the very last core on your chip is the best, then you kind of have to run with all cores enabled, unfortunately. But um, yeah, so congratulations to Dan Gilmore on the fifth place in the 5820K Super Pi 32 million rankings. Now let's move on to the last score of this week's roundup, which is Noxinite's uh, reference frequency, um, fifth place in the world. So reference frequency is basically just a test of what's the highest uh, base clock that you can run. In this case, though, we're talking about the FSB clock uh, on the on the LGA775 platform with a Gigabyte GA EP45T-Extreme motherboard. Uh, it's it's one of those old Gigabyte motherboards that looks like a rainbow. <laughs> I wonder if those heat sinks are actually copper, because a lot of those old motherboards have copper-colored heat sinks, not actually copper heat sinks. There's a difference. You can anodize, you can anodize aluminum to look like copper, but I'm not sure about this one. But I, I have an old motherboard where it's like the heat sinks look like copper, until you actually like scrape off the anodization and realize, wait a minute, this isn't copper at all. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if that's the case with this board. Um, and, uh, yeah, we've got the Northbridge on dry ice. Yes. So Northbridge on dry ice, CPU on dry ice. Um, and the board managed to boot or more like take a screen, like save a validation file is actually the technical term. Uh, save a validation file because in order to upload, a, to post a score to the CPU-Z validator, you need to save a validation file and upload it. Um, and yeah, so the board was able to save a validation file while having its uh, base clock running at 731 megahertz, which is very, very high. Um, in fact, you know, it's the top five base clocks of all time. Um, and you'll notice that there's a, like, a lot of gigabyte extremes at the, at the top of this ranking here. So, yeah, a very, like, this is a very sort of... Uh, well, this is a very popular ranking because you can do it on any motherboard, right? Like literally any motherboard is uh, eligible for a base clock overclock. It's just that um, most of the modern ones can't do this kind of thing because LGA775 just... Like I don't even know why it does be like FSB that high. It just does that. So this is like an F LGA775 thing. Um And yeah, so being at the top of this ranking is is very impressive. And then also, uh, it is the third place score for the uh, EP45T Extreme rankings as well. Um, so yeah, a very impressive score here from, from or more like a very impressive validation here from from Noxin. I unfortunately I can't give you really any more details on this because I just don't know that much about LGA775. Um, which is sort of why I saved this score for last, because it's just like, well, um, it is very impressive. And this is a very diff like difficult category, like any kind of validation. Like on paper, it sounds like, oh, that's going to be so easy. But the thing is, yeah, it's easy if you just give up early. If you're one of those people who's just like, okay, well, this this does you know, a high frequency. But what if it could go one megahertz higher? And then you spend like... A ridiculous amount of time and effort pushing it ever further um, so it's kind of easy to get ca like ca I guess carried away with with this kind of like I know with like CPU validations for FX chips like I will quite happily sit there for like an hour or more 
trying to go like 10 megahertz faster than I've just done. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I can't I can't imagine it's any different for this, though this is probably more difficult because at the like you're overclocking your CPU, your memory, your everything at the same time. Um, right? Because you are raising the base clock, so everything's getting overclocked, and that probably introduces quite a few more challenge, like quite a few uh, more challenges. So, yeah, congratulations to Nox and I on the fifth place uh, in the, well, fifth place reference frequency validation. And that is it for this week's Hardware Bot Score Roundup. So, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for watching. Um, like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below if you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking. I have a Patreon, there's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. It would be much appreciated if you check out the uh, Patreon or Teespring links um, since they help out immensely with running the channel. And that is it for the video, so thank you for watching and goodbye.